Bom dia. Good morning. Um, eu gostava, antes de mais, de, de dar uma explicação relativamente à composição deste painel, que por razões uh, que transcendem a organização das conferências, teve que ser modificado. E isto porque os uh, outros dois oradores previstos para, um, para este painel uh, tiveram contratempos, um definitivo e outro momentâneo. O, o professor Wang Wei uh, e veio. Obrigado. Que deveria nos acompanhar, uh, teve por uh, instruções diretas do presidente Xi que se deslocar hoje a Bruxelas e, portanto, só chegará a Lisboa hoje à noite. Vamos ter a ocasião de o ouvir amanhã no painel sobre as pessoas, uh, que salvo eu terá lugar às 11h30 da manhã. Uh, e, portanto, é um contratempo para o qual uh, encontramos uma solução. As coisas são como são, havia um compromisso, mas houve uma instrução direta a, a, do presidente chinês relativamente a um acordo com a Bélgica e ele teve que se deslocar uh, a Bruxelas. Mas vamos ter a presença dele a partir de hoje à noite e amanhã poderemos ouvi-lo. O, o Vuk Jeremic, um, que como sabem uh, uh, é um amigo destas conferências, já participou nelas, uh, teve há dois dias a sua primeira filha, que estava previsto que nascesse só para a semana, mas estas coisas acontecem e um, por essa razão uh, ele não, não pode estar em Lisboa connosco, pede imensa desculpa mas uh, promete regressar de novo uh, nas próximas uh, conferências. Uh, dada esta explicação, eu passava a apresentar uh, o, uh, as pessoas que me acompanham aqui na mesa. Temos, uh, em primeiro lugar, o, o nosso uh, orador principal, Uh, que é subejamente conhecido, o George Friedman, que vem de Austin, do Texas, uh, é um conhecido forecaster da geopolítica, reconhecido internacionalmente, autor de vários best-sellers, como The Next 100 Years, The Next Decade, e o seu mais recente livro, uh, Flashpoint, um, o Dr. Friedman é o presidente e fundador da Geopolitical Futures, uma publicação online uh, para análise, explicação e previsão da evolução do sistema internacional. E antes uh, de iniciar uh, a Geopolitical Futures em 2015, foi presidente da empresa de Global Intelligent Stratfor. Uh, temos o prazer de o ter hoje connosco em Lisboa e estou certo que o vamos ouvir com muito interesse. Uh, a acompanhar e a animar o debate que se seguirá, uh, temos do meu lado direito o professor José Manuel Félix Ribeiro, também conhecido de todos, que é consultor da administração da Fundação Gulbenkian e é doutor em Ciência Política e Relações Internacionais pela Universidade Nova, Uh, e, como sabemos, autor de uma extensa obra focalizada principalmente na geopolítica, na economia internacional, na perspectiva estratégica e uh, é docente da Universidade Nova de Lisboa e, do meu lado esquerdo, o diretor executivo uh, do Clube de Lisboa, uh, o professor Fernando Jorge Cardoso, também autor de diversas obras sobre estes mesmos temas e uh, uh, professor universitário, também uh, conhecido de todos. Os dois vão ajudar o debate que seguirá uh, à intervenção uh, do George Friedman. Uh, 
Mr. Friedman, thanks for coming. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I just gave a brief explanation about the change of our panel, uh, but uh, mainly uh, we are here to listen uh, from you, uh, and uh, we are very glad that you could come to Lisbon and join us in this uh, conference. The floor is yours. Thank you. It's always good to be in Lisbon. It's a happy place. There are a few happy places in Europe today. But this is one of them. Either you know something the Europeans don't know, or you don't know something the Europeans do know. I don't know which. So I want to begin with two dates that are crucial in understanding this moment. One is 1992. Three things happened in 1992. The fall of the Soviet Union, the signing of the Maastricht Treaty, the implementation of the Maastricht Treaty, and the emergence of the United States as the only global power. Remember that until 1992, there was a Cold War. It did not always look like the United States would win. The United States is obsessed with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is obsessed with the United States. With the fall of the Soviet Union, it was like if you've ever seen tug of war and somebody cuts the rope. The United States was completely off balance. It did not know how to respond. It still does not know how to respond. We should remember that the British Empire begins with Britain being defeated by a third world power that could never possibly do that, the United States. Nevertheless, in spite of this defeat, the British Empire emerges and dominates the 19th and the first part of the 20th century. It is almost inevitable when you look at Rome or other empires, but the first stage of beginning an empire is not planned. And the political system that is governing it doesn't know what to do. So it should not be surprised that one of the characteristics of the world is the only global power, very uncertain, as to how to respond to events. What are the things that matter to the United States? Where should it involve itself? Where should it not involve itself? These are uncertainties that will take a generation to work out. So we live partly in a world in which the organizing power is highly disorganized. And this is simply the process of unilateral global power. In 2008, something else happened that's extremely important. What I will call the global export crisis. From the 1980s onward, the international economic system overbuilt its industrial plant. This was particularly true in emerging countries like China. Their industrial plant had to be larger than the domestic consumption because this was how they would generate the capital to maintain that. And this was regarded as brilliant because it was believed that those countries that could export the most were the most efficient. And those who couldn't export were weak. It ignored one basic problem, which is that the exporting power was a hostage to its customers. If its customers couldn't buy, its industrial plant was paralyzed, to some, some degree. In 2008, a financial crisis, the fourth since World War II, hit, and it destabilized first the United States and Europe, which were the great customers of China, and they could no longer buy as much as they had from China. And the Chinese, who were dependent on the marginal increase of exports, suddenly staggered. Their basic model of neglecting domestic c consumption and maximizing exports ran into a, a brick wall. Uh, they were, in effect, owned invisibly by the United States and Europe. As I say, Walmart and Carrefour were the great powers that govern China's future. And suddenly, China had to find a new way 
to manage a system. Uh, after this, you wound up with another problem, which is those countries that sold to China primarily industrial production, industrial minerals, oil, copper, now they had lost their market. For a very long time, it appeared to the commodity markets that, well, the Chinese will go back to consuming. The price should stay up, they want to buy more, because the Chinese will consume. They did not understand that the decision on consumption by China was in Europe and the United States. If they could buy, then they would buy more goods. Finally, in, 1914, uh, in 2014, it became apparent that the Chinese production capacity would not rise, primarily because although the United States was slowly returning to normality, the Europeans were much more divided in their consumption patterns, much more limited in what they were going to do. It meant that China, now facing competition from Vietnam, from Colombia, from Paraguay, other countries, at lower costs, uh, was not going to regain the position it had. And so the price of oil, particularly, fell. This destabilized Russia in the sense that the promise of some sort of construction of a normal modern economy, which had been neglected since 2001 for various political reasons and structural reasons, was not going to happen. Now Russia had to worry about its ability to maintain its national budget, and that was very difficult. It had to dip into its reserves, and it's still struggling with this question. What had been a very powerful position, an exporter of energy, became a trap, because it, energy consumption was not growing. In fact, in many places it was declining. The second country that experienced this was Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia was built politically on oil. It was built politically on oil because it could maintain the internal stability of the Saudi kingdom with the careful distribution of wealth, stabilizing the tribal systems within the royal family all these things that had to happen. The Saudis are no longer able to do this. Suddenly, the Iranians emerged, dominant in Iraq, present in Syria, dominating Lebanon, operating Yemen. So you look at the map, all around Saudi Arabia, the heart of the Sunni, it's surrounded by a Shiite power. How deep, how powerful this power is, this is another question but it certainly destabilized the Middle East. So you had a situation where the Chinese now had a financial problem, which always follows a decline in exports. You know, how to manage bad debt. And they didn't know how to do it, because managing an NPL crisis, a non-performing loan crisis, normally requires somebody to be hurt. The creditors, the debtors, somebody is going to pay. And the Chinese, like every country, didn't want anybody to pay. But since they were going to have to pay, it had to have a more powerful central government to control the pain. And Xi emerges not out of China's strength, but out of weakness. If it was strong, they wouldn't need a dictator. But it's not strong, and it needs a central government that can stabilize it through an extremely painful period of time. For example, it has to get rid of the corruption, and for that, it needs a powerful leader who is not vulnerable to counteraction. In Russia, you have Putin, who had promised prosperity and returning Russia to being a great power, not quite having the prosperity any longer, not quite a great power, doing things in Syria, partly because he can, because he must do something. But of course, the greatest danger in Europe is Europe. The problem of Europe is Germany. Germany exports 50% of its GDP. That's an extraordinary amount for the fourth largest economy in the world. 
we're not here talking about the Czech Republic or Slovakia. We're talking about Germany. Its largest single country consumer is the United States. Because the United States is an import power. It imports, which has its own crisis. And the problem is that the United States is going to have a recession. We have never gone longer than 10 years without a recession. Uh, we've gone eight and a half now. We will have a recession because recessions are necessary and healthy to an economy. It gets rid of weak businesses. It frees capital for new businesses. It is, as every economist knows, part of the business cycle and necessary, and we will have one. Now, the first thing we will stop buying is industrial machinery. That's always the case in the United States. And who are we buying industrial machinery from? The Germans. So now the Germans are facing the possibility of an American recession, and that this American recession will not hurt the Americans nearly as much as the Germans. Normally, they would depend on their financial system, but this is the amazing thing. Germany, economically seemingly powerful, has a chaotic financial system. Deutsche Bank, Commerzbank, they cannot finance the German way through an economic crisis. Partly because they avoided economic crisis by using Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank to finance their way out of that crisis. So now Europe faces its own problem. In each country, this becomes a social and political problem. For China, the solution thus far is Xi. That is this political solution. For Russia, it is a strengthening of Putin's hand and the question of who is in the shadows waiting for Putin. We will see, this is Russia. For Europe, it is the rise of nationalism. Because Europe has never established the idea of what it is. What the European Union is, is a treaty organization. You draw, join a treaty organization when it's good for you. You leave when it's bad. But it also wants to talk about a European character. That's a good idea, but the problem is, the Germans know they're not Greeks. The Germans say, I'm not Greeks, and I'm going to give the Greeks money. And the Italians know that they are not French. The English know they're not really European. And so what is happening is the rise of nationalism, to which the answer is Juncker yelling at everybody to stop doing it. But of course, they're not going to stop doing it, because the question in Europe is, what is it that holds us together? The answer is prosperity. What is Europe without prosperity? Or what is Europe with divided prosperity, in which Netherlands has one set of expectations of what life is about, and Greece has another? Okay. So the problem here is hyper-interdependence throughout the world. In the previous crisis like this, the Third World Debt Crisis, interdependence was much lower. It was therefore managed in a certain way that did not have ripples across the entire system. This crisis has ripples everywhere and they won't stop. In this crisis, Germany depends on this country for its consumption. That country depends on another. Everybody depends on each other and it works perfectly in prosperity. But it is the management of economic dysfunction that is the measure of a model. And that isn't there. And so it is a good idea that all of Europe be one, but the Europeans have long memories. I am born in Hungary, and my mother still would not forgive Romania years ago. So my father said, for Europe, the basic principle is never forget, never forgive. And Maastricht was designed to say, everything is forgotten, everything is forgiven. And it was, until 2008. And then the question became, what does Germany owe Greece? 
Germany is lecturing Poland on liberal democracy without any sense of irony by the Germans that this is a very strange thing to do. Uh, the Hungarians are going their own way and they don't care what happens. You're seeing Europe return to what it is. A continent of 52 different nations with different languages, different histories, different enemies, different friends, who had gotten together to be rich. They did not get together to help the Greeks. In the midst of all of this, the United States has an import crisis. The import crisis of the United States is we fueled our economy by cheap imports from the world. As a result, large segments of the American society lost their jobs. And the, this, this segment has risen up. And that rise has produced an extraordinary person, Donald Trump. But you would expect it. You may not expect this much, but you would expect, you would expect a very strange player. Because the people who used to be in control have for this segment of society, about half America, lost credibility. So the difference is, I like to say, Obama would have said about North Korea, uh, we regard this as a serious violation that will have the gravest confidence, the great, greatest um, consequence. Or, but Trump said, we're gonna bomb you to your glow. <laughs> Both said the same thing, but in different words. Obama was much more <laughs> pleasant about it. Now, this is an opportunity for the enemies of Obama to say he's crazy, and for Obama to say this is a swamp, and we Americans love to have fun. We're having a great, great time with our politics. But it doesn't change the fact that the United States is 25% of the world's economy, and the only global power, and it doesn't know what it's doing. How could it? It didn't expect to be in this position. We are still trying to figure out a generation later what it means to be the world's only global power and whether we want to be the world's global power or whether we'd rather be left alone. And you could recently see this in Syria where Trump said one day I'm leaving and the next day he bombed the Syrians. But the nice thing for the United States is we can afford to do that. We can afford to be crazy. Many European countries don't have that room for maneuver. You have to be much more careful in what you do. So what we are living in is this. In 1992, for the first time in 500 years, no European power was a global power. None. Russia was the last, and it fell. The only global power was the United States which was completely unprepared for this. The world created a structure that was what I'll call cantilevered, like a Gothic cathedral. Every part depended on every other part, and if you pulled one part out, the entire thing came down, plunging the world into an economic crisis, which is now a social and political crisis. You can't put the genie back in the bottle in Europe, in China, in the United States, anywhere. We are now in a political period of instability, and in that political period, we will hack through for the next 10 years at least, trying to find out what to do. But there is one constant in all of this, nationalism, which the European Union wants to declare to be evil, and it can, but the fact is that there's a secret in Europe, a secret in China, a secret in Russia, and a secret in the United States. I'm an American, you're a Portuguese, they're a Russian, he's a Chinese. And we love who we are. We have a love of one's own. The notion of a European, well, Europe is a place. It is not a people. And so, as this crisis deepens, we are drawn farther and farther apart. Juncker's solution, I love Juncker because every day he gives me something to laugh at, is to demand that it stop. Well, good. <laughs> but somehow, Orban doesn't want to listen. Uh, we demand that the Chinese stop aggressively exporting, but they must. They have no choice. We want the Russians to stop being 
pseudo-aggressive. They're not really aggressive, but they want to look that way. They can't. And you want the Americans to stop being irresponsible. And we won't. So we are in a world where we are trapped by reality. And all of the fine position papers that are produced in Brussels and in Washington are irrelevant to the fundamental problem, <coughs> which is that we're in a moment when history is out of control and we're traveling. This is not necessarily the most comfortable position to be in, but it's even more uncomfortable when we have the illusion that we're in control. What policy will we follow? Who cares? History is on its own. It is very difficult to conceive of being in control of this situation, especially until the United States grows up. So, on that lovely note, <laughs> let me stop and be told why I'm crazy. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. I must confess I was curious about um, the development of certain items that uh, you mentioned in the, your recent interview of one of the major news, Portuguese newspapers, and you covered all of them. So I think we have a good base for debate and uh, discussion. And I give the floor to Professor Jean Manuel Feller Ribeiro to make some first comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I'm very happy to be here, although my English has not been trained during the last uh, years. Uh, I think uh, what Professor Friedman. What Professor Friedman uh, explained to us is something very important because globalization, as we uh, know it, from the 80s, from the 1980s to today, has been an asymmetric, a very asymmetric economy with a huge a country with huge debt, uh, huge deficits. The United States and three or four countries with huge surplus. But what is curious is that this is the best way that a country with an international currency does. Because the United States with their deficits gave liquidity to the world economy and created the conditions to the development of other countries. The problem was that this deficit never constitute a problem because the United States created debt that everybody in the world wanted to buy. With this debt, the United States could have a very extended defense uh, apparatus that was not paid all of it by the United States citizens. This was very important to understand because who bought, debt, who bought United States debt? First of all, the Asian countries that were protected by the United States, one from the other, because the, 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 the Asia Pacific countries uh, have very problems with each, with each other. But the presence of the United States give peace and give them the opportunity to develop economy and not spend many thing, many money in weapons. The second uh, origin of the capital that gone, gone to the United States was the Persian Gulf with the, the, the oil countries that were friends of the United <coughs> States. So everybody bought the debt of the United States and the United States could create more deficits and give more liquidity to the economy, to the global economy. The problem uh, was that in a certain moment, this has attained a tipping point 
and then exploded. It was the crisis uh, of 2008. This is a very important crisis because it was the first crisis in the United States having a capital market financial system, which make for the Europeans with a bank financial system completely impossible to understand what has happened in the United States. They, uh, the, the answer of the United States to this crisis well, was to go to the cyberspace. Cyberspace is the most global and free space in the world. There are no frontiers. The United States invented the cyberspace. The, the firms of the United States organized the cyberspace, and the cyberspace is the opposite of protectionism. But when everybody needed some new country to have deficits, the answer of Germany was we must have more surplus. Today, the, 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 the Euro Eurozone has the biggest surplus of the world. Not today, it is not China, it is the, the Eurozone. So, Eurozone, directed or leader by Germany, has the complete, is the complete opposite of the United States with the uh, international currency. It has surplus when the world needed that Europe would have deficits. So the, the, the tension between the United States and Germany is going to be extraordinarily deep. But this, not, this, has, this is not about protectionism. This is about a new phase of globalization. And we are all very badly prepared, as Professor explained so well, but I have a face in Europe. Uh, this is the last thing I, I, I will uh, say in this first intervention. I, uh, we are commemorating the May of uh, 1968. In my modesty, I was an actor of this crisis in Portugal with the, the student movement. Today, 50 years after, when I think, what, is, what was the importance of May 1968 in France? I will say, today, it was President Pompidou. Because Pro President Pompidou changed two things very important. First, he decided to invite United Kingdom to Europe contrary to the Gaullist tradition. And second, when they were discussing how to uh, give the dollar a lesson, the Europeans, President Pompidou came to Azores to have a meeting with Nixon. And from where came Jorge Pompidou? From the Rothschild Bank. Rothschild Bank is an extremely important reality that, that, that does not exist for us. It's completely secret. Not secret, we don't understand. What is important today? It is that President Macron comes also from the Rothschild Bank. And so, France is trying to, sh to, to, sh to, to sh show that they understand Germany, what they don't. That it, they, are disp they are disposed to do everything to satisfy Germany, which they don't. But they understood clearly two things. First, it was important to speak to Trump. Second, it was important to decide to build the, the new fighter aircraft to Europe, uni uh, uniting 
United Kingdom and France. This is, has nothing to do with the European Union. This has to do with the strategy of the states. States must have strategy to survive. This is something which we have completely forgot during the last 30 years in Europe and in Portugal. Mr. President, I don't know if you want to comment right now or you prefer to have this uh, second, first comment. It's up to you. I would say only one thing about 1968, which I think is a crucial year. It was a period not only the French Rising, it was the period of riots in Chicago, the election of Richard Nixon, who later had to resign, it was a worldwide uncertainty. It was the Chinese proletarian revolution. Every 50 years or so, the global system undergoes spasm. It not, doesn't necessarily produce anything new, but it spasms. In 1928, before then, it was the great global depression that hit the United States, but also hit Europe and so on. And in each of these cases, the most interesting thing was the rise of what had been exotic political leaders. The political class that emerges from that is unlike that which went before, and that period appears to be catastrophic. So if you look at 68, one of the things is what the students said, which is the problem with students is they grow up and they stop being students, and then what happens? But what happened was it appeared to every reasonable person that the global system was collapsing. Okay? It didn't. It reformed itself. So now we have exotic leaders. Exotic leaders in China, exotic leaders maybe in Russia, you want to call it exotic. Certainly in Europe, you've got quite a crew. And we have the best of all because we're Americans and we always do the best. <laughs> but the thing to remember about this is that this marks the transformation of the global system not in and of itself an unsustainable crisis. So you say, how will the United States survive Donald Trump? Very nicely. How will China survive Xi? It's done it for thousands of years, it will manage. So our horror at what is happening is really the birth pains of a new era. And all the things we are seeing around us are simply saying the old era that we love so much is unsustainable just as 1968 basically said the old culture and era of that period was unsustainable, and 1928-29 said this is unsustainable. And the thing that we have to do is remember two things. First, no one will believe that. They will continue the wait to bring back everything the way it was. And second, it won't go back. And the people who will make money, well, those who know it won't go back and will anticipate the future, and those who will have political power will also be those. So as you said, Pompidou understood that it can't go back. Nixon understood that it couldn't go back, but he didn't know what to do. So we had Ronald Reagan eventually taking the United States into the future. You must understand that whether you want it or not, history is doing its rhythm. You are part of that rhythm, and Portugal will not be the same afterwards. I would also like to add that when I speak about the European Union failing, that's not Europe. Europe is a prosperous, enormously important place, and it consists of Portugal and Spain and Italy and Germany and all these other places. But it, the structure that was created in the Maastricht, which was only a few, a few decades old, uh, this may not necessarily survive, but Europe has gone through many such changes. So that's what I would like to take from you in your talking of 68. It represented a very good model of this global spasm. Okay. Thank you, Fernando, for is yours. Thank you. It is, uh, it is an honor to be here. Um, I was not supposed to be here, but that's why I consider this a double honor. Um, well, um, uh, 
my intervention is, is this one, and my perplexity, I will put at the end. After the Second World War, uh, growth, economic growth, I mean, and all the dynamics associated to economic growth started, let's say, a very long wave. Uh, the first 25 years, uh, United States, Europe, and uh, in general, developing world had grown. E even the socialist world suffered, suffered no, benefited from economic growth. A lot of things happened, a lot uh, of systems were built and accommodated, and then suddenly we entered into um, political and energetic crises, uh, associated with the crisis in the 70s. And then this long economic cycle after the Second World War entered into a negative slope, let's say. Uh, by the mid of the 70s, somewhere alongside the 80s, until the end of the Cold War. And it was in this second phase of the cycle, in this negative slope, that emerged a lot of things that were the um, response, uh, I'm speaking about the technological response, the economic and productive response to a new world. We should remember that a lot of innovations came to the fore since mid-70s, with computerizing, miniaturizing, uh, optical fibers, new materials, uh, uh, engines that spare the energy, etc., etc. The, the 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 related economic things about the, the strategic defense initiative of Ronald Reagan and things like that. And then when the surge surge of globalization, I mean the second long economic cycle, in my view, that we are living today after the Second World War, emerged by the end of the 80s, also with a very strong political. Um, um, earth earthquake, which was the end of the Cold War and of other things also. And Maastricht, etc., etc. But uh, in the first, uh, in the first, first let's say, in the <coughs> two first decades, the 90s and the first decade of the century, we had growth, uh, economic growth in developed countries, in developing countries. At the end of the century, Europe, European Union began to collapse, uh, if we speak about economic growth, as a consequence of decisions taken before about the creation of a new currency and the problems associated to it and other questions also. And uh, suddenly, uh, mainly when we approach the middle of the second decade, these long economic cycles began on the negative phase. And we are in this negative phase. My point and my perplexity is the following. Now we are again hearing and speaking about technological innovations, about things that maybe will be a part of the answer to the problems we are facing, like robotics, like artificial intelligence, like something that could in some way uh, counter the effects of devaluation of labor in industrialized economies, and in some way could also going on the counter effect of the negative things of nationalism, because I do not think that nationalism is negative per se, is not negative or positive, is a fact, a fact of life. So my point is for you, George, uh, because you didn't speak about this aspect of the things. How do you look at this interaction between the political situation and its effects, and the economic situation and its effects on the social, if, if we put together the technological innovations that we are in this moment witnessing? Would you see 
that this is an important factor. We don't know what will happen, of course, you said that, that before. But how do you look at this? Uh, will this really be an important aspect to follow? Is it important? I know that we, we can say here in this room that it is important for the politicians and for the governments to think or to do that and they don't care, they don't listen to us and they, do, they don't even know what to do. So that, it, it, at any way, we are in a conference, we are in a divide. So my, my first point should, should be this. How do you look for this negative economic and political slope, but at the same time a very positive, if we speak about innovations, technology. How should this mingle? How do we look at this? Thank you. So, thank you. You began speaking about the 1970s. I think in terms of core technologies, Technologies that spawn other technologies. The steam engine, electricity, which spawns communications and a range of other things. Uh, the internal combustion engine, which transforms transportation. Now, we pick 1915 arbitrarily as the beginning of the mass-produced internal combustion engine, automobile. By 1965, it is mature. It is not that it's useless, it's incredibly useful, it continues to exist for decades, but its development has only marginal, you know, you can make a disc brake out of a regular brake, you cannot tr transform it. And its impact on, on growing productivity declines. So when you introduce the automobile, you have a massive upsurge in the 1920s. Um, then by 1965, 50 years later, it's not growing that much. The microchip today is the same age as, in terms of industrial use, is the same age as the automobile was in 1965. It is not high tech. It is a mature technology, and it's been a long time since I've had any app aside from Tinder that I want to look at. Um, Really, when you take a look at productivity growth in this period, it looks very similar to what you saw in the late 60s, early 70s, a sudden decline. So feeding into debt crises, feeding into structural shifts, you have the maturation of a technology. Again, the maturation doesn't mean it's useless or getting rid of it, it will be here for a long time but the quantum leaps in productivity that it produced are not there. Now, in the 1960s, all the fantasies were about a continuation of transportation. Transportation was a great, and we would have rockets that go from city to city, we would have rockets to Mars, we would have all sorts of transportation, because when an ex a technology exhausts itself, you believe in extrapolations. You ever watch the Jetsons, I don't know if you got it here, when you know that there were going to be jetpacks that we were going to fly around in. So the entire fantasy was, yes, it's exhausted, but wait until all the new things happen now. We are now in the same period where the only imagination of new technologies is more of the same. And we call it artificial intelligence. I was working in artificial intelligence in 1988 and to produce maps that we needed, and it was easier to do it by hand. They called it artificial intelligence. I don't know what artificial intelligence is. No one does. Because we can't produce an analog to our intelligence because we don't know how we think. We do not understand thinking. How do you produce artificial intelligence? You will produce more powerful programs, more powerful mi microprocessors, you will produce any number of things, but the idea that we are going to produce an analog to human thought implies that we understand human thought. But it's an important thing to watch the fantasy. The fantasy of the 1960s was all sorts of fantastic things uh, made out of the old technology. Same thing with the, um, the first airplanes were conceived of having a steam engine in. This didn't work. <laughs> but it was the point of extrapolation. 
which means that the next decade is going to be a very difficult one, like the 1970s, where you had economic crises, you had an exhaustion of that particular technological culture, and normally it takes about a decade for it to come out, and it's nothing you will ever conceive of. So I will, the first time I saw a microchip was in a store at Cornell University, and it was a handheld calculator, and it had a microchip in it by Hewlett Packard, and I looked at this and they said, you want $250 for this? This is crazy. I never thought that because of that I would be buying clothes at Amazon and never leaving my bedroom. It never understood what it meant. So the next technology will be similar. It will be something that's here now. No government is producing it. Uh, some crazy guy who can't get a date is, <laughs> is sitting in his garage, he never bathes, and he finds things. And he doesn't even know what he's finding. And that will be it, and I have no idea what it is. But historically, if we go back in the Industrial Revolution, there is an imperfect rhythm. I made it sound perfect, it's not perfect. It's an imperfect rhythm of the production. So this is a classic period, the 2020s particularly, of economic dysfunction, social instability, and a decline in technological innovation. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just before going on debate and taking some questions, I would like to put um, one from my own. Um, your idea is that uh, Europe, namely European Union, uh, never was an independent body until the beginning of the 90s because it was controlled either by the US, either by the USSR. And only after Maastricht until 2008, uh, when uh, the Soviet, uh, the Russia expansion and the Lehman Brothers crisis arrived, uh, uh, it was a short period that the European Union uh, was controlling uh, its own uh, uh, bodies. Uh, my question is, who is controlling uh, Europe now? Well, usually no one controls Europe until little men with mustaches decide they want to take it all. <laughs> Europe is never, it's not easy to control. It resists centralized control because it is so diverse. It is true that until 1992, Europe was occupied. It was occupied by the Americans and the Russians. The Russians wanted to impose governments, the Americans wanted to make money. But still, the question of war and peace was not decided in Lisbon or Berlin or Rome, it was decided in Washington and Moscow. And I should ask, add that Washington and Moscow behaved incredibly carefully to avoid war. Had European diplomats from 1939 or 1914 been in charge, God knows what would have happened. And, and this is important to remember because we tend to think of the Russians as irresponsible and the Americans as crazy. They were very careful not to rock the boat. Then Europe was free to do what it wanted. The United States was the first one that wanted a free trade zone. Part of the Marshall Plan was an integrated European economy. The French resisted. They didn't want to be working with the Germans. They didn't want to be working with the English. The French didn't want to work with anybody. <laughs> so nothing changes. Um, 1992 was a critical moment, and it has to be understood. This was not a European moment. This was an American moment. It was a Russian moment. It was a Chinese moment. It was a world system shifting apart and opening the door for Europe to chart its own future. And it did. It was the Maastricht Treaty. And how it comes out, well, you know my opinion, but how Europe comes out is Europe. It's, it's still there. It is still a one you know, magnificent place. So I would argue that it has to be understood that the European Union does not exist in isolation. It is part of a global system that adjusted itself in 1992 and gave space for the European Union 
And then the European Union aligned itself very carefully with forces in China that were developing, aligned itself very carefully with the United States. But the idea that suddenly there's this independent European Union, it is in the same way as the United States or China is intimately integrated into the international system. And the idea that the international system can fail or decline or have a crisis and Europe not be subject to it is the essential problem. You said there was one crisis. From my point of view, there were four crises, financial crises. There was the municipal bond crisis. There was the third world debt crisis. There was a savings and loan crisis, my favorite, I never understood it. <laughs> and then there was the subprime crisis. Each of them were built around one assumption, a class of assets that could not decline. Municipal bonds could not decline. Third world could, debt could not decline because spaceship Earth was running out of oil and you just invest in that and you will make money. Savings and loan, I don't know, what couldn't decline. <laughs> And houses and prices in the United States could not decline. So it begins with a complete misunderstanding of what it was. Now, how did the Americans deal with it? On a Sunday afternoon, Paulson and Bernanke and six bankers got together in a small room, broke 50 laws, and the banks opened the next day, and that was it. There's no room to hold all of the ministers of the EU. I mean, where will you have that meeting? In the, in the soccer field? <laughs> and this is the fundamental question that sometimes in political systems you must get a bunch of peoples with a common interest and they must make a deal. And Bernanke looked at the Citibank and said, you're donating so many billion dollars. And they said, oh, no, no, not. Yes, you are, I'll send you to jail. All right, well, I'll give it. <laughs> so, but there's no one in the, the EU is not built to handle crises. When the crisis hit you here, the national governments were trying to cope with them, but they didn't control their currencies. So it was, I think, a free trade zone makes perfect sense. Uh, we don't tell the Mexicans what to do. Well, we tell the Mexicans what to do, but they don't listen to us. <laughs> I mean, you had a free trade zone that was working wonderfully. Uh, it became too ambitious. So you will find a new place. But I think the urgent thing to understand is that Lisbon depends not only on what is happening in Europe, but it depends on what's happening in the United States and China and elsewhere, because that is defining what is happening in Europe. None of us are fully in control of what goes on, at least of all Europe. Thank you. Okay, we are taking uh, three questions to start. We have two and one there. Thank you. I'm Alfredo Valadao. I'm a professor in Paris. Uh, and I'm Brazilian, but nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I do agree perfectly with what you said. I, um, you said that history is tragic, and particularly in this moment, and I do absolutely agree with it. But I would question the feeling about it, which is that uh, there is another constant in history. Is the more it gets worse, the more you have will and people trying to solve the problem uh, on this. And humanity can be mean, and it had been mean for a long time, but no one likes to commit harakiri. Some nations tried, but they didn't really succeed. Uh, they're still there. Uh, uh, and another thing, that nationalism, in the end, is a very recent ideology, as an ideology, uh, in this, and can die too. Uh, so, uh, when you say the hyper-connected world has to face this resurgence of nationalism, I do agree. But you also said that we cannot go back. Uh, and if nationalists win, it's cows, and cows is not a solution. So we are in a transition. I think we do agree with that. But we are in a transition from a model that exhausted itself. Mass production for mass consumption with mass media. And we're entering, I don't know how and when and whatever, 
in a model with this network customized production to customized consumption and customized media of the social uh, networks. The question is politics. How the new politics will adapt to this new model, which is a new revolution so important than the industrial revolution in the beginning of the 20th century. And so it can be an authoritarian model. It can be a model that is more uh, can defend our rights and uh, our fundamental rights, but that depends on the people who are going to do that. Uh, so uh, it is bad for us that are old people, but for young people, it is quite exciting. The spirit you have to build everything about it. Uh, so that's why I'm questioning a little bit the feeling. I'm old too. So I'm saying, oh, this world is bad, we're going to have horrible, uh, everything's going to go down, so have fun. Yes, we can do all this. But for the young people, you cannot say that to them. You cannot say, have fun. No, you have to say, go ahead, take, take charge, try to find new things. This is the only thing I wanted to say. Well, to the young people, they won't listen anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we take the second question now. So we can, we no? can stay between ourselves. So. <laughs> Hello, my question is very much long. Can you identify yourself, please? Uh, uh, my name is Mary Caldor from the London School of Economics. My question is very much along the lines of the last questioner. If we think about these phases in economic development, the automobile phase, even though it started in 1915, was only really globally diffused after the Second World War, and it was the consequence of politics. It was the consequence of big government. It was the consequence of a commitment to redistribution of income. It was to left politics, actually. Um, and I think at the moment, what we are facing is that our political institutions are not fit for purpose. They don't fit the technological changes that have happened. And that explains the current crisis. But I think history is always a kind of mixture, a dialectic between the idealistic and the cynical. And, and what I missed really was the idealistic. If I think about what you said about Europe, for my generation, and I'm old too, I'm the post-war generation, and for us, Europe was all about ending wars on the European continent. It was a peace project. It was about ending fascism, ending imperialism. And there is an idealistic element to the European project that hasn't completely gone away. If I think about, and, and the <coughs> early steps of European integration were not only the free zone, they were also the agricultural policy, which was kind of social policy, they were also structural funds. And if I think about the Maastricht Treaty, it was immediately after the Cold War when there was a kind of idealistic reinvigoration of the peace project because we wanted to end the Cold War divide of Europe, we wanted to end the occupation by the United States and Russia. Um, and at that, but it was a compromise, actually, between the Europeanism, that kind of Europeanism expressed in Jacques Delors, and at the same moment, and this seems to always happen in moments when the technological model exhausts itself, the rise of market fundamentalism. So, and I think that's what's led us to the crisis. So I suppose my question wants, and, oh, and just to finally add, I think if we are going to find political institutions for the new era, we can't rely on the old nation state model. And what's interesting about the European Union is that it's potentially not a new nation state, a new great power in the making. It could be a model of global governance. I'm not saying it is, but it could be that is about taming and dealing with the worst aspects of globalization and it's that kind of institution that we're going to need if we're going to overcome the crisis. Well, I am, I am an idealist. Uh, unfortunately, I have different ideals. So, which one of our ideals 
One of the foundations of war is different ideals. The Soviet Union was idealistic. Nazi Germany was idealistic. They both had terrible ideals. I distrust idealism. I distrust idealism because people kill in its name. And the idea of idealism is benign is sometimes, not always. So, I'm certainly not feeling that this is the end of the world. 1970s wasn't the end of the world. We had a magnificent up, right? but I'm saying that we are in a difficult period and there will be an upsurge. A upsurge based on new technologies, new institutions, and so on. Now, I want to talk a little about the nation state because there's a contradiction between the fear of the nation state and the belief in liberal democracy. When you read Montesquieu, when you read Rousseau, the nation was the foundation of liberal democracy because national self-determination was the fundamental thing. One of the great moments of European history was 1848. And 1848 was the rise of nations asserting themselves against empires, saying, I am not a Habsburg subject, I am a Hungarian, and I want to, with my fellow Hungarians, determine my nationhood. So Europe has a very complex history. Now, if national self-determination, which I recall back during the heights of American intrusion in other countries, is a fundamental value, the national self-determination must be, in some sense, about the nation. If it's not about the nation, then what determines? What is determined? Uh, if there is no action by the citizen directly in controlling what the government is and the commonality between the government, well, you don't have national self-determination. To cut liberal democracy off from national self-determination creates a theoretical problem embedded in liberal democracy. So, Europe, of course, created the EU, but that's because it had a catastrophic history. It had Nazi Germany, who had taken nationalism to a point of horror, and it was Europe's project never to allow that sort of thing to happen again. It was understandable. Now, it's trying to find the balance between the fact that we must never allow national self-determination to devolve into Hitler. And at the same time, we must retain the principle of national self-determination to enable our liberal democracy. And this is the problem that Europe faces. It fears itself and tries to build institutions to keep itself from doing what it did. Understandable. I'm Hungarian, and I wish you wouldn't do what they do, did. But at the same time, you believe in liberal democracy. And in, be, in believing in liberal democracy, you can't simply separate off liberal democracy from the right to vote, and the right for that vote to determine what kind of government you have. I mean, you can do that if you want, but it, it doesn't work. It's not only doesn't work, it's empirically not working. And Poland and Hungary have had votes that the EU disapproves of. And that's very nice, but this Orban and uh, the Polish prime minister essentially were overwhelmingly elected. Now, how do we manage Europe on the principles of liberalism, which believes in national self-determination, in the context of the EU, where the EU says there must be national self-determination, but if the vote goes in a way that we disapprove of, we may intervene. Or if it says we are overwhelmingly committed to not allowing Hitler to happen again, so if you appear to be like Hitler, we have the right to stop you. The EU confuses me. The EU confuses me because I don't understand the rules, and the rules keep changing. It is not that the idea of a united Europe is unpalatable. Frankly, I don't care. 
it's your, it's your choice, but it doesn't seem to have a clarity. It wants to have all sorts of things blended in. So my view is, one, I certainly don't, I'm not despairing, I have grandchildren, and I expect them to live in a much better world, but it's gonna be a lousy five, 10 years. That's, that's life. And I don't feel that Europe should not have a degree of uniting, but I think it needs clarity. And I don't think it has the political will to clarify that. But if it does, then it will. But in the end, my American side says, do what you want, guys. If you're satisfied with how things are turning out, it's not my problem. My Hungarian side says, it's very dangerous when a supranational entity comes in, because that's what the Habsburg Empire was. That's what the great imperial powers were. Now, this is not a great imperial power, you say. Well, to a lot of people in Europe, it appears that way. And they have to be addressed. So, it's a confusing issue. I have no solutions. I don't live here. It's okay. We have one more question there. Uh, Thank you, Professor. Just like you uh, comment on three points. First, um, the reconciliation of North and South Korea. How it comes? What was the trigger? What is uh, the expectation? Was the rebuild? What what will be the um, the result by the end? Second point is all the mess in the Middle East. Uh, do you think um, there is? after that uh, um, kind of uh, democratization of these countries, um, changing regimes, if there is a plan for a new uh, sachs picot agreement to remodel the Middle East. And the last point is, uh, uh, what about fundamentalism? It, is it uh, going to, be, to continue as a, a day uh, 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 happenings, uh, it is going to wane or uh, it's going to increase? What's your opinion? Thank you. Well, on, on, on Korea, the answer is that South Koreans opened this door because the North Koreans had artillery aimed at Seoul. And they really didn't want to have their capital city destroyed. And so they opened a dialogue with the North Koreans and the North Koreans didn't want war they were using their nuclear program to bargain with the United States. The problem now is everybody has a different goal. If the North Koreans give up the nuclear weapons, they're gonna want something for it. And what I suspect they're gonna want is a withdrawal of US forces from South Korea, a partial withdrawal, but some loosening of the American presence. The South Koreans don't want that, they've made that clear. They don't trust the North Koreans that far. Uh, the Americans don't want to withdraw because they don't want to open the door to the Chinese. The Chinese want us to withdraw because they want the door opened. The Japanese are horrified by all of this. So finding the solution between all of the stakeholders here is very hard to imagine, but we've had very good photo ops. And I suspect since this is diplomacy, they will avoid the problem by carrying on talks in the next 30 years. Because I don't know what, they may have some solution that I can't imagine. On the Middle East, nobody imposes an order and certainly no conference will impose an order. Uh, the Middle East runs by its own clock now. Particularly because it is no longer of strategic importance to the United States or Britain or anyone else. The, development of oil in the United States has reduced the significance of the Persian Gulf. And whereas in 1973, the United States regarded this as a fundamentally important area, it isn't. So this is what happens in a region where no one cares. So people want no one intruding into a region, this will be it. In the meantime, the basic problem of the region is not fundamentalism, it is the Iranians. The Persian Empire is not back, I mean, that overstates it. But they are operating with great power in the region. The Israelis are getting ready to hammer them. 
The Americans are hoping that they don't have to get involved, but they will get involved. Uh, the Turks are trying to figure out if they can stay allied with the Iranians or have to. The Turks are the most interesting because they're historically the most powerful country in the region, and normally they impose the kind of settlement. It's not pretty when they impose it. They just impose it. But the Turks are not ready to take that role. They don't want to take that role. They are amazingly allied with the Russians and the Iranians, sort of against the Americans, except quietly the Americans are working with. So this is the Middle East. So I will tell you a joke. A frog is swimming across the Suez Canal. And a scorpion says, give me a ride across. And the frog says, I'm not going to give you a ride across. You'll sting me and kill me. And the scorpion says, um, why would I kill you? I mean, I drown with you. All right, get on board. Halfway across, the scorpion stings him. The frog says, why? The scorpion says, welcome to the Middle East. <laughs> That's my only joke. I have no other jokes. Good day, teacher, Mr. George Friedman. I am Fernando Horda, and I am retired of Millennium BCP Bank. My uh, asking, my question to you is very simple. Don't you believe, sir, that England will ask in future to return to uh, Union uh, European Union um, coming back with its come out and uh, will ask to stop its away. Thank you. You understand? I think you said, is it going to go back? To I think that England in future will return to, to come uh, join to uh, Europe Union, yes. I, I think the British will want... Thank you. What, what the, I think the British will want what the Germans must have, a free trade agreement with Europe. Britain is Germany's third largest partner. Germany cannot... You know, it exports to them. It's the United States, France, and Britain. It cannot break trade relations with Britain. That's insane. They will not let it happen. So, Britain is prepared, I think, to have a free trade zone. Britain is not prepared to have the Brussels prepare, uh, override its laws and things like that. It's, it also is historically balancing now, not historically, but between the United States and uh, Europe. And as Europe fragments, its reliance on Europe declines and it turns to the United States where it can also have a free trade agreement very quickly I think and I think all parties would welcome that and so Britain is taking advantage of its strategic position between the two tilting back and forth as it sees fit but I think you know for all the rhetoric that comes out of the British uh, uh, banking community I mean they're missing the point which is that Britain is the second largest economy in Europe, and it's simply being expelled from it would vastly disrupt the European supply chain. So the idea that the Europeans, except for Juncker, of course, he's my favorite, uh, that the Europeans really want to punish the British, they're good negotiators. It'll go on for a while, but I think they will leave. I think they will get a free trade zone of some characteristic. I think after that, May will be replaced by someone who condemns everything she did, but changes nothing. So, it's British politics as usual. We have one question. Back there. Thank you very much. My name is Ansari Susio Economy. I think uh, globalization and uh, domination is very different. 
because for the globalization, its qualification, the production is very important. But the United States, United States, it want for domination for economy. Is now because policy is very different for economy. Its name is now. Its policy is domain economy. It's not economy. Policy or politic in domination in economy in the world. Thank you. From my point of view, politics and economics are the same thing. It's different ways to look at it. But you cannot understand a society without economics. You can't understand it without politics. They're constantly interplaying. One can be understood mathematically, sort of, and the other can't. So different departments and universities handle them. But from my point of view, there are three elements of any nation state. One is economic, one is political, one is military. All of them are real, all of them interact, all of them have different grammars. But I, one of the principles of geopolitics is to argue the distinctions that we talk about here don't really have much meaning. How can I understand economics without politics? Boa tarde já. Uh, eu queria fazer uma pergunta uh, ao coordenador, ao moderador da mesa, se me explicava o que é que aquele senhor está a fazer aqui, ali, porque desde o início que está a trabalhar, e eu ainda não percebi o que é que, não sei se isto é só apenas uma questão minha, se não depois nós conversaremos sobre isto, mas de facto eu gostaria de saber o que é que se passa ali, uh, daquele lado, depois que não se vê, sei que está a trabalhar desde o início, e, e, e gostaria-me imenso de saber o que é que se está ali a passar, porque não estou a perceber. Pronto, esta era uma, a outra era uh, se, uh, o império, se a saudade dos impérios e dos califados não vão, uh, enfim, abanar esta geopolítica e esta caixa de Pandora. Muito obrigada. Uh, vou, vou, vou responder-lhe em português. Uh, nós na conferência anterior já o fizemos e nesta conferência também, é um graphic recording, ou seja, é uma forma de mostrar de uma maneira, a partir de bonecos e de pequenas frases, tudo aquilo que se está a passar em termos de apresentações e debates. O que aquilo está, ali estava a ser exposto lá fora depois, no final de cada sessão, cada um de vós poderá tirar fotografias e depois nós integraremos isto nas nossas redes sociais e nas publicações que vamos ter. É uma forma de animar o debate. Portanto, esta é a razão pela qual o Daniel Perdigão está a fazer o trabalho dele. E bem, como irão ver. Relativamente à questão que foi posta, eu passo a palavra ao George. Okay, so uh, empire is a term that's used very lightly. Empire to me means an imbalance of power such that one nation can have unbalanced influence among the others. That imbalance is not a conspiracy or an attempt to, it may be a preface to it, but it is not in itself a problem. Um, it is a natural occurrence. So the United States at this point, because of the size of its economy, 25% of the world, its military force, has an imbalance of power in the world. And therefore, it can influence events to a greater extent than others. You could call that an empire. It's a useful term to talk about these imbalances of power. But we usually think of empire as the British Empire, a system of systematic exploitation and political oppression in various areas. That's one form of empire. 
the Persian Empire was a very nice system like the EU. There's one central government, but you go have your own until we don't want you to. Um, there are many forms of it. I, I, the term, I think, has become a probium since Lenin. It's understandable why. Many people are offended by it, but I find the term explanatory. Okay. Um, we are going to have uh, uh, one, two questions, and then we have... Uh, uh, for First, first we have one question there, and uh, after there will be a, a final uh, statements, and uh, mm -hmm. after you close, okay? Okay. So, Ambassador. Thank you. I'm uh, Fernando Neves. I'm fortunately a retired ambassador. <coughs> and, um, well, I'm glad you said that uh, European Union confuses you. It means you have scored a point. Confusing the Americans is one of our objectives. This was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> I didn't hear that. I said that I'm glad that you said that the European Union confuses you. That means that we, the European Union, have scored the point. We are confusing <laughs> the Americans. <laughs> uh, having said that, you, I appreciate very much your crude realism. Uh, but there's one point you didn't touch, which is, what is, how much does the financial institutions deregulated uh, are, con con uh, are con conditioning democracy? This is one point. A second point related to that one is that when you deal with underdeveloped countries, one of the problems is that they are not able to collect taxes. They are not able to collect the taxes they should collect from the, uh, the economy in the, that country. And now we have more or less the same situation. I mean, they have this huge uh, cyber or whatever, I don't know the name of the new technology uh, companies that don't pay taxes. Fortunately, in the European Union, someone is trying to make them pay taxes. But if you, if you uh, think about these companies that don't pay taxes, there was, I don't remember which one or whatever, that was not paying 13,000 million, uh, billion euros in Europe. Uh, um, to, uh, to add to that, with the free circulation of capital, you have the offshores. So the problem is that nobody's paying taxes, or at least as it used to be, which means that those who pay taxes are being punished, and, and the, 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 those institutions that don't pay taxes have a huge control in the policy of the world. Thank you. I would summarize that problem this way. Ever since the 1980s, there has been a movement of rationalization of the economy, both in moving it to low-wage states, in re-engineering the corporation, as it was called. And part of that, in the United States at least, was driven by the tax code that made it advantageous to invest. And this has created a social catastrophe. The accumulation of wealth uh, within a narrow stratum at the top has created one crisis, which is more money than can be invested, <laughs> driving the cost of money down. And the other has been a devastating loss of jobs and income uh, through the American heartland. So. I'm not sure that deregulation was the problem. I think it may have been, but I think the essential problem was the change of the tax code, which, remember, had to be done because there was a massive capital shortage in the 1970s. Interest rates were astronomically high. And by changing the tax code, it encouraged investment, and we had a surge in the economy. But as with everything economic, all good things must end in bad. And we are at that point of badness. And this is really almost a worldwide social problem. Certainly a problem in the United States and Europe. Because one of the things is the social disjunction between those who cling to the institutions that made this happen and those who are rebelling against it. So 
in the Brexit story, I mean, there were those rebelling against it and those who were saying these people were ignorant and had no idea how terrible it was. And to which the other people said, you have no idea how terrible it is down here. And this is a social problem of the United States. It is a social problem of Europe. In a very strange way, it's a social problem of China. But it's a worldwide problem of, we might call it oligarchy, but it's more complex than that. I think deregulation of financial institutions probably lend to it, but I really think it was the restructuring of the economy to cope with the capital shortage that was not stopped, as it never is stopped, in time. That's the best answer. Last question there. Uh, please, how do you see the risk of Europe becoming uh, as, the mid uh, as irrelevant as the Middle East is today? Sooner or later that will happen according to history. How do you see that risk in the near or and the so not so near future uh, to, to happen to Europe? Is he talking about immigration to Europe? No, not about immigration. About uh, uh, all, according to history, to all, all the powers increase and decrease and they die. And Europe will die as all other powers. How do you see that risk looking from today? I, I think it's very high. It's very high because even within the context of the European Union, the divergence of national interest is already showing itself. Look, who would have imagined 20 years ago that Scotland would seriously think of leaving England? And 45% would decide that. How many people would have thought that Catalonia would come back? But we would have all thought that Belgium would be fighting with itself. But the point I'm making is, if you step back, there are movements in Europe that you would not have imagined possible 20 years ago, Catalonia. You are also animosities in Europe developing that you wouldn't have imagined. You wouldn't have imagined Poland and Germany facing each other the way they are. Hungary and Germany facing each other the way they are. Britain leaving the EU. I mean, step back, take a look at the way the world was 10 years ago. Take a look at the way Europe is now, and the change is dramatic. It is not dramatic just in, in rhetoric of professors or anything like that. It is fundamentally changed with fragmentation of states being taken very seriously, between states schisms reappearing, and so the question is, what is the force that contains this? Now, to be a little cynical, it's not a new policy paper out of Brussels. There has to be a systemic shift somehow that accommodates the forces that are demanding this. But as we would expect, they are being dismissed and frequently held in contempt. I re this reminds me of 1920 in Europe when the rising forces of fascism were dismissed as unimportant. And rather than getting in there and competing for the sympathizers of fascism and bringing them over to the party, uh, they further alienated them by holding them in contempt, underestimating what would happen. So I think it's a very dangerous time. I mean, the very thing that the EU was designed to avoid is emerging. I, I say this not as uh, a theory, it is, you know, a demonstrable empirical fact. Now, one of the problems in the 1920s was that the liberal parties could not speak <coughs> to potential Nazi supporters, it's fascists. They could not formulate a position. The difference in the United States, we had our fascists, Huey Long, and Roosevelt created a coalition of southern racists, northern blacks, 
Jews and Italians, and, and it was an amazing coalition. He understood that he could not isolate racism. He had to embrace it, undermine it, do what he could with it. In Europe, it was far more rigid. But the Europeans never imagined that the fascists could win until they won. And this is the problem. You use the term populism as if a self-evident evil. Another way to use it is a deep dissatisfaction among the public that is being exploited by parties that you despise. The more you despise their members, the more they will join. So I think that Hillary Clinton lost the election not because the Russians, but when he called all of Trump's supporters deplorable. No one ever wins running against the other party's voters. You need to take them. But that is the most troubling thing about Europe, the self-satisfaction of the elite and the feeling that the solution is to isolate uh, their opponents. I think the Roosevelt example of completely unprincipled manipulation really has to be considered. Somehow or another, you, a coalition has to be put together of enemies. Now, I don't know many European politicians who have the subtlety for that. Thank you. We have now two final uh, comments um, and then a final statement, a statement from our speaker. Uh, the floor is yours, Professor. Uh, it, was, it was a fascinating uh, discussion here. Uh, uh, the only thing I want to say, it is about the question of the United Kingdom. United Kingdom, it's not only the second economy in Europe, it's the only modern economy in the, all over Europe. But United Kingdom understood better than us and before us that create an international currency and open our frontiers to migrants in an indiscriminated way was something which was going to have bad results and they maintain outside this project. When they, when they decided to leave the United, the United uh, uh, Europe, we must not admit that we are going to, in the continent, put all of us integrated, centralized, as a, a new world power. What is going to, uh, to, to happen is that Germany and France are going to reflect about what we want of Europe. And in two years, three years, we are going to see that Germany wants not a Brexit, but a Germanix. <laughs> because Germany has not the, the, the capacity to integrate the south of Europe and the east of Europe. When German, nowadays, as I had said before, Macron has decided that they must have the United Kingdom with them. So what I think is that in three, four years, we are going to have a free trade area without Brussels. And with an extremely good relation, with the United States in the second presidency of Trump. I think it was going to be that, like that. <clears throat> well, who knows? That's a fascinating thing just to see. Uh, there are, of course, other alternatives, and they are not exactly contradictory to each other because there are common uh, interests uh, in both ways. I mean, I believe that 
<clears throat> up to a certain way, there is a very strong push towards maintaining at least peace in Europe, just so business and economics can continue its own way. Anyway, uh, my point, uh, I, I had an extended conversation yesterday, uh, I would say for this panel, unfortunately, with uh, George Friedman, because I put all the questions that I had to put today, yesterday, to him. So I will not commit the same, uh, uh, I will not do, do, do the same. I will only ask George to tell us something that he told yesterday, and I think it's important uh, uh, for Portugal. And the question for him, it's not a statement from me, it's a question. The question for, for, for him is forecasting the near future is very difficult, but it, it's his job, it's not mine. Um, uh, uh, how, how, how can you foresee uh, the role, uh, a role for Portugal in all this conturbed world? Well, first I want to say, I have tremendous admiration and confidence in Europe. The European Union is not Europe. It is an institution, a treaty organization, that may or may not be useful. But having been born in Europe, having enjoyed Paris, enjoyed London, having studied in Freiburg in Germany, I mean, this is a, an invaluable part of humanity. It is, however, an invaluable part of humanity that has historically gone in very strange directions, sometimes painful ones. One should never be confident in Europe. Um, that said, I mean, the future of humanity in many ways is here, more than in the United States even, for now. Later, we'll see. Uh, what role do I see for Portugal? I mean. I can project the future primarily by looking at the past. Uh, Portugal is very unique in Europe. It is bordered by one country, Spain. And Spain is in some ways unpredictable. Your historic commitment has been to Britain. The British had an interest in this region and you had an interest in Britain and you've had a long and very fruitful relationship with Britain, and that would seem to me to be the foundation of uh, Atlantic Portugal. Now, since you're Atlantic Portugal, and since the US Navy now dominates the Atlantic, we might extend that to a relationship to the United States and Britain, since the British-American relationship will get much stronger, I think. Uh, this is an other block. So we think about uh, you know, various blocks, uh, such as the Baltic block and uh, the Black Sea block. I think there's an Atlantic block developing. And that Atlantic block has common interests. And uh, you should, uh, you need to be agile. Everybody likes agility as a theory. In practice, it's very uncomfortable <laughs> because you have to keep moving. Uh, but agility for, for Portugal at this point is critical, but it's back to old habits. Staying inside the EU, outside the EU, Britain is your key partner and America could become that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Friedman, on behalf of Club of Lisbon, thanks for coming and share with us uh, all your views about uh, these different items and I hope to see you here in Lisbon uh, um, next time. Uh, para todos, muito obrigado pela vossa presença em nome do Clube de Lisboa e temos... E o programa continua da parte da tarde. Muito obrigado.